Good. Um, so today we're going to continue our uh, perusal of the visual system. So we started last time with the eye and the optic nerve. And um, so I want to... Um, can everybody see this okay? Yeah, why don't you dim the next light bank back. Uh, I talked about three different kinds of... Um, that's a little bit better. I can also shut the shades if anybody's having problems seeing it. Um, three different kinds of neurons that are in the optic nerve. We have P cells, M cells, and K cells. Um, now, unfortunately, I had a flash demonstration that show how these work and uh, we'll see in a moment whether they actually installed flash on this computer. Um, so this is what happens if uh, for a uh, P cell, if you put it inside the cell's receptive field, you see that it generates action potentials at a very rapid rate. If you put it in the, um, come on, there it is. If you put it in the inhibitory region, it slows way down. And then if you move it outside the receptive field, uh, it will fire at its uh, regular backup rate. Um, M cells have a different behavior. So here the cell, there's no light shining. It's firing at its background rate. If you then shine a light inside the positive part of the receptive field, you see the spike rate goes way up. But then it gradually slows down until it's back to its background rate again. And then if you turn the light off, it slows down to nothing and then creeps back up to its background rate. So these are sometimes referred to as transient neurons. Uh, they only respond to changes in the pattern of light, either a light being turned on or a light being turned off. We'll come back to this a little later when we talk about uh, visual attention. All right, now from the optic nerve, um, the cells project to a region literally in the very middle of the brain called the lateral geniculate nucleus. There is also a side, couple side pathways uh, to the pulvinar nucleus and the superior colliculus, uh, which I will come back to later. Um, so the way to think about how this works, the left visual field over here projects to the right side of your eye, all right? And the right side of your eye sends projections to the right side of the brain. The right visual field projects to the left side of the eye, which then projects to the left side of the brain. So the bottom line is, is that your right brain is processing the left side of the world and your left brain is processing the right side of the world. And so if you look at the optic nerve, it has two branches, one from the, the left side of the retina that goes to the left brain, one from the right side of the retina that goes to the right brain. And that happens in both of the eyes. Uh, so the part of the retina toward the nose is called the nasal side. Uh, the part of the retina away from the nose is called the... Um, temporal side. Now it turns out that the different kinds of cells project to different layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus. So here we have um, again the optic nerve going back into this part of the middle of the brain in the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus and the lateral geniculate nucleus has different layers. And um, I think that's demonstrated in the next slide. So they have um, P cells, go to these that are stained brown. Uh, there are four layers that receive inputs from P cells. 
Um, there are two layers that receive inputs from um, M cells, and then in between all of those are layers that receive input from the K cells. All right. So if you think about it, what the what the visual system is doing is early on, it's separating out processes and se or separating out features and sending them to different parts of the brain. Right. So there's one part that is processing the static information from the P cells. There's another that gets transient information, motion, from the M cells. And then there's other layers that are getting inputs from the uh, K cells. And again, they're doing more basic level stuff like um, uh, controlling pupil diameter, um, things like that. It may be involved in circadian rhythms, the much more basic stuff about vision that we usually don't pay much attention to. Now, not only are these things kept separate in the lateral geniculate nucleus, but they're also kept separate as you go up into the uh, visual cortex. Now, again, I want to emphasize this because this is, uh, this is a, a really basic property. What the brain is doing, it's decomposing the input into elementary features and it's keeping them segregated from each other, at least early on. They come back together much farther in the brain, but early on it's keeping these features separated. And as we see, as we get higher up, a little bit higher up in the cortex, it's, um, it's pulling out more and more properties uh, to keep separate. So the magnocells, the M cells, they go to the strike cortex level 4CA Whereas the P cells project upward to the striate cortex in 4CB. So not only are they going to different layers in the thalamus, they're also going to different layers in the, in the cortex. Now, the cortex has a pretty odd organization to it. Um, not surprisingly, uh, there's much more cortex devoted to the fovea than there is to the periphery. I was watching a show, God, this must have been 30 years ago, it was a Nova show, on uh, the, the title of the show was How Animals See. And so what they did was they would uh, take like a bee's eye, which has lots of little facets on it, and they would filter images through a bee's eye and then they'd say, this is what a bee sees. And they'd do the same thing for a horse's eye or an ant's eye. Or, and we're watching this and my wife is going, oh, wow, this is really cool. Why don't you do stuff like this? <laughs> and um, it's um, disgruntled anyway. And it's, so going through this, I started thinking for a second. I said, wait a second. If they did that to a human, it doesn't bear any resemblance to what we see. Right? So if you filter the world through a human eye, what goes back to the brain, you'd have a region about the size of your thumb with really high acuity, and everything else is blurred as hell. <laughs> but that's not what we see, right? We see, somehow, everything looks reasonably, uh, we have reasonable acuity throughout the visual field, but we don't. Right? We're building that up as a model by fixating at different locations in the visual field. Right? So what we actually see doesn't bear a very tight resemblance to what's actually coming in the eye. Uh, the other thing that's different is that the image in the eye is upside down. Right? So if I look at your projection on the back of the, my eye, you know, your head's down and your knees are up. It's not what I see. Um, so anyway, what this is showing is that a good major chunk of the um, visual cortex is devoted to processing the fovea, and as you get farther and farther out in the periphery, uh, there's less cortex devoted to it. Um, so actually, you don't know very much about what's happening in the periphery. The one exception to that is that you're actually more sensitive to motion in the periphery than you are to um, uh, in, in the fovea, because the M, that's where the M cells are primarily. Some of you may have seen this. If you've ever been in a room 
which has a 60 hertz fi um, light fixture in it. And looking in the room and you see the fixture blink. Any of you experienced that? Now what happens if you look directly at the fixture? I guess I thought that I would continue to see it blink, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so you'll only see that in the periphery. This used to be really common, one sec, used to be really common in the old days when uh, they first had um, computer monitors, they were 30 hertz. Um, which in the periphery, you, you know, if you, so if I'm looking at you in a monitor and I look over here, right, the monitor's just blinking on and off, drives you crazy, but as soon as you look at it, it stops. That's because you're more sensitive to flicker and motion in the periphery. You had a question? Yeah, how about if you're in a room and the light is flickering, but you can't really tell because it's in your periphery, but it makes you nauseous? Is that due to the same concept? Uh, yeah, you're more sensitive to flicker in the periphery than you are now. Whether that makes you nauseous or not, that's a whole nother beast that we won't talk about here. Um, Motion sickness is a very complicated phenomena. For some reason, I don't know the answer to this, um, the, if your visual system and your vestibular system are telling you something different, the natural response of the brain is to throw up. <laughs> um, now, I experienced this personally. Have anybody heard of a term called Meniere's disease? Uh, so, a Meniere's disease is something that I have. It's where uh, you salt in your ears kills off the hair cells. And um, so, in my case, it killed off the hair cells in the, in the semicircular canals, which is what controls your balance. Um, and um, I would have bouts, actually I was, when this hit me, I was giving a lecture in this very class, not this room, but this class, where I actually threw up in class because uh, I had this incredible vertigo and the first response is, the class was wonderful. They go, oh, can we help you, Professor Todd, get back to your office and I'm just, it's like I'm walking around like I'm totally drunk. And I had to, I had to, I had to swear to my otolaryngologist he made me promise that I'd never again climb on that ladder. Um, but any event, there, there are effects like that that can happen if, if your vision's telling you one thing and your balance system is telling you something else that leads to motion sickness. All right, so what I wanna do now is I wanna show you an old film from um, uh, two very famous researchers in vision research, David Hubel and Thorsten Weasel. And these were two of the first guys to really get in and start probing around in the visual systems of cats. And uh, as you'll see, um, some of their discoveries are, were really based on serendipity. They didn't know what they were doing. And they wasted a lot of time trying to figure it out. But I'll let them explain that in their own words. This is a very young David Hubel. I'm guessing this was taken in the 70s. We can walk into this region and look to the left, and you see on the next picture what that looks like. Here is the smooth surface of the primary visual cortex. This is the part that's tucked underneath. And uh, now you begin to see that it's a layered structure. Some places the cells are packed tightly, other places they're looser. Uh, and underneath every square millimeter of cortex, which is about that much, you have something like 100,000 cells. The researchers actually listened in to individual nerve cells firing at the anesthetized cat as they presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Thorsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments and they didn't go well because but at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots onto the screen. And we found that the 
black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. And even more than that, the line produced a response that swept across the screen in one direction, but not in the reverse direction. Of course, that could have simply been a, a, an oddball cell. We didn't know whether we'd ever find another such cell. But after some weeks or months, it became pretty clear that most of the cells that we encountered in the visual cortex demanded just that kind of stimulus. Although from one cell to the next, the orientation varied. And a number of other things differed. The line was the important thing. So this is a basic summary of what they found. So uh, usually what they do is uh, uh, you can break down the cells in the primary visual cortex into three basic types. So there's what's called a simple cell. And a simple cell uh, does not respond to a, well, I mean, it will respond to a moving line, but the motion is not a critical aspect to get the cell to respond. Um, so if you have no stimulation at all, the cell will fire at its background rate. If you have a line at the edge of the receptive field, the cell will no response at all. If you have a bar in the center of the receptive field, you get the maximum response. If you start varying the orientation, the response gets weaker. And if it's in the orthogonal direction, then you get no response at all. So this particular type of cell is sensitive to a bar of a particular orientation and a particular width. And you can demonstrate the orientation property like so. So if you look at the, the spike train, you'll see this cell likes vertically oriented lines. And then the number of impulses per second drops off as you alter the orientation from 0 to 20 to 40 degrees. All right. So these cells are very specific. Uh, they'll only fire if you have a stimulus of a bar of the right orientation. And it also has to be a bar of the right width. So here we have, again, another simple cell. It has a receptive field that looks like this. Um, if you have a narrow, if you have no stimulation, it fires at its background level. If you have a really thin bar, you get a moderate response. As the bar gets thicker, you get a strong response. Then if it gets thicker still, the response gets weaker. And if it fills the whole receptive field, uh, it drops off to the background level. Now, the key thing to keep in mind here is that as the bar gets wider and wider, as long as it stays within this excitatory part of the receptive field, you're going to get an increase in the spike rate. But as soon as the width starts to impinge on the inhibitory areas, that's going to cause the spike rate to drop off. How many of you have ever heard of a mathematical technique called Fourier analysis? A few of you. So I'll, I'll, I'll just give a verbal description of what this is. So there's a very famous mathematical theorem um, that was proposed you know, mid 19th century by a French mathematician, a guy by the name of Joseph Fourier. And what he basically argued is that you can take any complex signal and break it down into a series of more elementary components. All right, And in this case, the components look very much like this. All right, so what, um, and I, I'm not, I'll go into a little more detail on this in the next class, but the point is, is that the, the brain is doing something very similar to what your cell phone does when it deals with images. 
So when you send an image to somebody, what format is it usually in? JPEG, JPEG, is. JPEG is one. Not the best one because that's a noisy format. Uh, there are others called PNG or TIFF. And what those formats are doing, the reason you use them, is they greatly compress the size of the image, right? So they're, they're designed to do data reduction. They're really efficient ways of coding a signal so you can get it from point A to point B, all right? And those formats are very similar to what the brain is doing in the early cortex. All right, it's breaking down uh, the signal into elementary components in a way that guarantees you're not losing very much information, right? But it's a very efficient way of coding the stimulus. All right, so it's doing something very similar to what engineers do in the phone company or at Apple uh, when you're trying to keep complicated signals like voices and images and transmit them over the air, over a wire, uh, where you've got a limited amount of bandwidth. And that's basically the way you think about the early levels of visual cortex, yeah. How many types of each of orientation are there? You know, like, like are there, is there more than one that like, picks up just like the horizontal? I will get back to that in just a few seconds. Uh, well, maybe more than a few seconds, but just a few minutes. Um, so again, we talked about uh, local orientation, we talked about, uh, oh, this is another type of cell which is called um, a complex cell. Now this is the one that Hubel described in the video. So in this case, what this cell wants is a bar of a particular orientation that's moving perpendicular to its orientation. Uh, in a particular direction. So this particular cell, uh, if you have a vertical bar that's moving from right to left, you get a strong response. And it gives you that strong response throughout the visual field. You change the orientation, the response rate drops off. Uh, if you change the direction of motion, so instead of going from right to left, you go from uh, left to right, it also gives you no response. So whereas the complex, whereas the simple cells were sensitive to the bar width and orientation, the complex cells are sensitive to orientation and direction of motion. Now we'll talk more about motion later on in this lecture. And then finally, there's a third type of cell. These are a bit rare. They're called end stop cells. And these cells uh, are responsible to width and orientation, but they're also responsive to the length of a bar. So if you take something like this, right, you put a bar in here, you get a moderate response, uh, you get the maximum response when the bar just fills up the excitatory receptive field, but then if the bar is longer than that, you get some inhibition and it drops off. All right, yeah. How does it measure past the boundary of its own Uh, that's a good question. Uh, now, the way you phrased it is not right, okay. right? This is not a property of the cell. It's a property of the receptive field, okay. all right? The receptive field is a region of the retina to which a cell will respond. Okay. But you made a very astute observation, right? So if you say this is the receptive field, then anything that extrudes past that um, shouldn't have any effect at all. So in fact, for the end stop cells, the receptive field is bigger than that. Does that explain your question? Receptive fields can actually be really large if you consider secondary effects. Um, but I don't want to go into that level of detail. But, but your, your, your question is on target. The way I define receptive field, this can't have an effect by definition. So that means the receptive field has to be bigger than this area of gray that I showed you. Yeah? Um, are the receptive fields like adjacent to each other? So like in the last bar, would the little edges begin to excite 
the response in another receptive field? Uh, yes, the receptive fields can overlap. So different cells can respond to the same stimulus. The main thing to keep in mind here is this receptive field is sort of an abstract property, right? So imagine what you saw Hubel and Weasel doing. They had these lines. They're just sort of projecting on the screen and they're moving them around. And what they find, if I present the line in this sort of area, and they were bracketing it on paper, right? They said, okay, if I place the line in these areas, the cell will respond. Go outside those areas, it won't, right? Those things they were bracketing were the receptive fields. That's what they're measuring in that experiment. They're measuring what's the area of the retina. Now, it's not just the area that matters, it's also the content, right? So you need a bar of a particular orientation and a particular width um, and a particular orientation. These cells are very picky, right? Unlike my dog who will eat anything. These cells, picky. Any more questions about this? Yeah. Um, was the, the, were the bars, were they the bars of light projected onto the retina or onto a screen? Uh, both. Oh. Okay, so here's how it works. You get some poor cat. Actually, they, they learned fairly early on the cat visual system is different from the humans. So they, they stopped using cats after about 10 years and switched to monkeys. But it, it's not a pretty experiment. So you put basically metal plugs in the cat's ear and you screw them in tight so the cat can't move its head. Uh, and then you suture its eyes open so the cat can't blink. So the cat has its eye that's fixated in one particular location, all right? And then they have a map between positions on the screen and positions on the retina. So they're actually manipulating bars on the screen, but because the rat's eye is absolutely fixed in its socket and its head is actually absolutely fixed at a particular orientation, they can tell what the corresponding location is for a position on the screen and a position on the retina. Is that clear? These experiments aren't for the faint of heart. Um, I've actually participated in a couple of these, but only from afar. So my job is to make the stimuli and then some graduate student does all the measurements. but. Uh, I would have trouble sticking bars in the ears of a monkey, but uh, that's how we learn. All right, now I can get back to your question, which is, she asked, in case none of you remember, are there cells that are sensitive to different orientations? And the answer is yes. And they're organized in a very fastidious way. All right, so one of the ways that Hubel and Weasel did about uh, their experiments is they would go into different parts of the cortex and they would lower an electrode down to different layers. Okay, so let's say this is the surface of the cortex. They'd stick an electrode in, record from a cell, and then push the electrode a little deeper, record from another cell a little deeper. And what they find is that along a given path of those electrodes, right, at different depths, they discovered that all the cells have the same orientation sensitivity, right? So if you, if you go down a level of the cortex, you see all these cells here, they're all sensitive to the same orientation. Now, if you put, go parallel to the surface of the cortex, the orientations change in a systematic way. All right, so what the brain is doing is it's saying, all right, I'm going to put all the vertical orientations and I'm going to have neurons that are sensitive to those in a column in a particular part of the cortex. And then all the ones that are sensitive to slight tilt, I'll put a column right next to the vertical one. And so you get this ser series of columns, right? Whereas you go across the columns, you get slight differences 
in the orientation to which the cells are sensitive. If you go within a column, all the cells have the same orientation sensitivity. And you can, this is an array of columns using um, oxygenated blood flow in a tree shrew where you can actually see the pattern of this. So the different orientations are coded in different colors and this is how the pattern looks on the brain of a tree shrew. Very shrew, very much like it is in humans. You can do similar things in monkeys with dye. And this is an example of that. Now the other thing they notice in these columns is that um, some cells are primarily sensitive to the right eye. Some cells are primarily sensitive to the left eye. And guess what? The brain keeps those separate too. All right, so not only do you have columns that differentiate different orientations, you also have columns that differentiate the eye of origin. So this is how that works, right? This is a right eye column, left eye column, right eye column, left hand, and within here, right, you've got columns of all the different orientations. So you've got this hierarchical structure of the brain tissue. Um, and if you dye, if you inject a dye into one of the eyes, this is what the pattern looks like for the different ocular dominance columns. Now it gets even more color, uh, complex than that. So there was a famous discovery in um, 1978 by uh, Margaret Wong Riley, who noticed these little gray spots systematically throughout uh, the brain tissue. She called them blobs. And uh, it turns out that the cells in those regions are responsible, are uh, sensitive to color. Whereas in most of the columns, they're not. Right? So if we look at what's going on, you've got um, orientation columns with eye dominance columns and the center of each one of these rectangular structures uh, there's like a cylindrical space where you have cells that respond to color right so the brain's taking color orientation location right all those features it's separating out and it's keeping them segregated from one another uh, now i'll bring them back together later in the brain but this is the kind of thing you would expect Right? If you talk to um, a acoustic engineer who's trying to uh, maximize transmission over wi in wireless communication, right? They do similar kinds of tricks. They break up the signal into elementary pieces, right? But they do this in an informed way where they know the elementary pieces can get put back together later so you can get the original signal with as much fidelity as you need, all right? So I'm not gonna go into the mathematics of that, it can get very nasty, but I want you to get the concept of it, right? This is what the brain is most likely doing here, is that it's trying to get information from point A, the retina, to point B, somewhere deep back in the brain, and to do that in the most efficient way that is possible. And uh, certainly the way that nature has evolved to do that is one of the most efficient ways of doing that. Yeah? So if these lines are the basic building blocks that it's decomposing into, how are they, are, are there lines in, in the photons or the electronic waves? Is that what builds those? Oh, you're asking me hard questions of things I don't want to get into. Um, the line is something that Hubel and Weasel stressed. Okay. But if you actually look at the cells, they're not responding to lines. They're responding to systematic gradations where you go from dark to light to dark in the receptive field. So in engineering, that sort of thing is called a filter, right? And uh, most, most times when you have that, it's like a smooth gradation. 
All right, so you don't need hard edge lines to get these cells to respond. You just need an overall distribution of dark here, light here, and dark there. Or light here, dark there, and light here. All right? So like contrast, basically. Contrast of a particular form. Yeah. So contrast that's in, in a form that looks like this. Yeah. If you actually look at the weighting functions for those cells, you, they wouldn't have hard boundaries like they do here. They, they'd be more gradual. So this is the final picture of the cortex, right? This is, this is what you get in the cortex. This really elegant, hierarchically structured uh, pattern of organization. Uh, where you have ocular dominance columns, uh, orientation columns, blobs. So this is going to get you your stereo vision. This is orientation tuning. This is getting color. Um, now, the other thing that's going on, this is in one local area of the brain, but as you move out to the periphery, you're also varying the sizes of these things. Right? So the optimal bars get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you move out in the periphery. So it's, it's coding um, things of different width uh, as well as things of different orientation and things of different position. Very well organized structure. Okay, so this is primary visual cortex. Um, we know a lot about primary visual cortex and after that all hell breaks loose and we're pretty much clueless. I mean there's a ton of work that goes on in this stuff but um, you know how you do higher order functions, well we'll see what we know as we go ahead. So let me just give you some nomenclature. We have dorsal or superior means toward the top Ventral or inferior means toward the bottom. Anterior toward the front, posterior toward the back, medial toward the middle, lateral away from the middle. So these are the terms we use to describe different regions of the brain. And um, so there are two major pathways that people talk a lot about. One of them is called the ventral stream. Remember, ventral means down. So the ventral stream goes from the primary visual cortex down to the, um, the temporal cortex, this region right here. And there's also what's called a dorsal stream that goes from the primary visual cortex up the top of the brain, all right? So these are called the dorsal and ventral streams. They're also what are called the what where symptom systems, though that's a bit misleading because they probably both do participate in both functions. Uh, but we'll talk more about what we know about this. So one of the main sources of evidence of this is patients with lesions. So let's say you have a lesion up here in the brain, in the dorsal stream. The most likely symptoms of that are subjects will have, uh, hold up your pencil right, and tell me to grab it, right? So the subject with a dorsal lesion might do this, right? Subject with a ventral lesion would have no problem picking up the pencil, but if you ask that subject what this was, they'd have no clue, all right? That's why they're sometimes called the what, where systems. So lesion up here, you have trouble grasping things, Regions down here, you have trouble recognizing objects or faces. So an agnosia is a technical name for a, um, a physiological deficit in your visual capacities. And there are a number of different kinds of agnosia. So one is called apperceptive agnosia ventral lesions, you unable to recognize or draw objects from visual representations. 
Uh, associative agnosias, patient can perceive intact objects and draw them, but is unable to name them. Prosopagnosia, this is an interesting one where people are unable to identify faces. Um, balance syndrome is dorsal lesion. A uh, patient has poor control over visual guided movements and is unable to identify two objects at once. Uh, there's a film I'll show you. There's a section of the course we'll do later on um, recognition. And one of the topics will be on uh, face recognition. And I'll show you a really interesting film on prosopagnosia a little bit later. So here are examples of apperceptive uh, agnosia. So this is the stimulus you give the subject. This is what they'll draw, trying to match it. Here's the stimulus. Here's what they draw. Associative agnosia, so this subject does a pretty good job drawing, but they don't know what it is. Similarly here, this subject, right, you give them a picture of a pig, they draw a really good pig, but they'll tell you it's a dog. All right. Now, really interesting, done by um, Leslie Ungerleiter and Mortimer, Mortimer Mishkin uh, in 1982. So they did... Um, uh, this is where the what, where pathway names came from. So they train monkeys to uh, do two types of tasks. One is they would put a food reward under the prism-shaped box, but not under the brick-shaped one. All right, monkeys can learn to do that. Or they train monkeys that there would be a reward um, under the box that's closest to the cylinder. And then they uh, caused lesions in the monkey's brains. And what they found was is that if you had a lesion down here in the temporal cortex, uh, the monkeys could do this task fine, but they couldn't do that one. Whereas if you had lesions in the dorsal stream up here, the monkeys could do this task, but they couldn't do that one. This is what's referred to as a double dissociation. So the idea is, is that the, the upper part of the brain is telling you where things are. So my ability to locate objects in space is controlled by that. Whereas my ability to um, know that you're female and you're a male is happening in the, the lower part of the brain. Now here's a really interesting uh, subject. This is by Brenda Milner and uh, Mel Goodale up at uh, University of um, McGill, McGill University. And uh, they have a patient DF. DF's probably run a hundred experiments. When you get some of these patients, they run them forever. And um, if you ask DF, right, so you show VF, you show us up. So if I show you a vertical line, and I ask you to draw it, you'll draw a vertical line, all right, or something close to it. So, um, uh, right, this is what a subject, if you show them a vertical line, you ask them to draw it, you get almost no variance. If you ask DF to draw it, this is what you get, almost complete randomness. Can't do it. But yet, if you ask DF to take a puck like this and stick it through a slot, DF does that task perfectly. So what DF seems to be able to do, he can align right, one thing with another thing. But if you ask him to take that orientation and reproduce it over here, he's completely clueless. This is also what you get with balance syndrome. So this is a doctor patient. The doctor's told the patient to point to his fingers and he misses by a pretty big wild shot. Um, now finally, another source of evidence is, uh, this is also uh, uh, Leslie Ungerleiter and Greg Haxby. Um, in fact, Greg was here just last year gave a wonderful talk. Um, 
but uh, they did an fMRI says, do you all know what fMRI is? So just to remind you, what fMRI does, it measures blood flow in the brain. And so the idea is that when you're um, a part of the brain that's doing some task X, say, right, it uses a lot of metabolism and you need blood flow to refresh it. And so the idea, if you detect increasing blood flow, um, right, that's identifying the parts of the brain that are involved in a particular task. And uh, so they use two tasks here. Uh, one of them, I want you to keep your eyes on the red dot, and um, you're going to see a series of spaces presented. And um, when the same face is repeated, I want you all to shout the word yes. So while subjects are doing that task, this is the area of the brain that's generating greater amounts of blood flow. All right, so when you're trying to identify a face, regardless of where its position is, is this ventral region that um, is what is having more metabolism, right, which is suggesting that this is the region that has something to do with um, the object recognition. All right, now we're going to change the task. I'm not going to ask you whether the face is the same or not. I want you to tell me whether the location of the face is the same, regardless of whose face it is. Right? So if you see two faces in the upper position, you say yes. Um, don't say anything if you see face in the upper and then a face in the lower. Wrong slide, sorry. Come on already. There we go. And my cursor. So again, here you're looking for two faces in the same position. And there's an example. All right, when you do this, you have a different area of the brain light up, the dorsal region. So again, you see very compelling evidence that the, the upper part of the brain is telling you where stuff is. The lower part of the brain, it's telling you what the stuff is. So now the inferior temporal cortex is interesting. If you go in and you do um, single cell recordings in there, uh, what you find is, is that the cells respond to all kinds of complex stimuli. So let's look at some examples here. So you show the animal uh, rhinoceros, the cell doesn't respond. You show it a lion, it fires like crazy. 
you show it a giraffe, nothing. All right. So here we're getting cells that have much more complicated properties. Um, they respond to uh, a particular shape. I mean, sometimes the shapes are meaningful. Sometimes they're seemingly crazy, like a you know a circle on type top of a diamond. Um, there are a lot of face sensitive cells in this area. Um, there's one famous cell, the guy who pioneered work here, they, uh, um, they were recording from infratemporal cortex in monkeys, and they found one cell, so a lot of the infratemporal cells will respond to monkey faces or monkey hand shapes, but they found one cell that the best response was from showing the monkey a toilet brush. They found the first evidence of toilet brush detectors in monkeys. Now, I don't know if any of you have worked with monkeys before, but I can assure you they want nothing to do with toilet brushes, at least for their intended functions. The, um, now, the other interesting thing about these IT cells is that Unlike the cells in the primary visual cortex, they don't depend on the position of the cell within the receptive field, right? So if I have a hand over here, or a hand over here, a hand over here, the cell will respond just fine. So they have really large receptive fields, and they don't care where in the receptive field that the hand is located. Um, now this particular property has spawned, uh, there's a, a theory of uh, machine recognition that's based a lot on the, the single cell data from uh, monkeys, um, where you analyze the distribution of features without any regard to where they're located, uh, which in my mind is the, about the stupidest thing you could do to do object recognition, but uh, these things work in appropriate context. It's also really easy to break the models. And later on when we talk about recognition, I'll talk more about that. But that style of model is justified because of what we know about the uh, neurophysiology of the monkey infra, uh, infratemporal cortex. So the feature can be anywhere, right? Uh, it doesn't care about where in the visual field the object is located as long as it has the right shape. And they also respond to objects of different formats. So it could be lines. Um, it could be textured things. Um, and it doesn't care about the size of the images, just their form. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit, and I want to end by talking a little bit about motion perception. And um, we can remember when we talked about those complex cells, with the first cells that respond to motion, um, it was noted in, I guess, the mid 80s that um, there's a problem with those cells in terms of really analyzing motion. All they can do is to detect the component of motion that's perpendicular to the bar, right? They can't detect any motion that's parallel to the bar. Now, this may not mean much to you now, but hopefully I'll give you some demonstrations to show what I mean here. Um, okay, this is what's referred to as the aperture problem. So let's say this aperture is the cell's receptive field. That's the part of the world that the cell can see. And there's a bar moving in that receptive field. Um, you see these red arrows there? They all represent velocities, which are all completely equivalent as far as that cell is concerned. There's no way in principle that the cell could know 
if this bar is moving in a vertical direction, if it's moving in a horizontal direction, or if it's moving perpendicular to its orientation, because they all produce exactly the same pattern of motion. Um, and you can see, I think in this animation, if I move the cursor, there's my cursor, if I move it in here, I guess I demonstrate that in a different place. Okay, so let's, who shall I pick? Let's pick on you. Tell me what you see in the left panel. What direction is the bar moving? Um, upper left to lower right. So it's moving in a diagonal direction? And how about the middle one? Left to right. It's moving horizontally? Yeah. And how about that one? Horizontal. You see this is horizontal? How many see this as horizontal? Raise your hand. How many of you see it as diagonal? Oh, uh, I meant, I meant diagonal. You meant diagonal? There are no wrong answers in this class. What you see is what you see. Now, what if I told you that they were all doing the same thing? Would you believe me? No. Who said no? <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> so all I have to do is move my cursor in here, and you can see that it's actually moving horizontally. I move it out, and you see it as diagonal. Move my cursor in here. It's actually moving horizontally. I move it out, and you see it as diagonal. All right, so this is a demonstration. What your brain is doing here is a default. The motion is completely ambiguous, but you, whatever you see there, you're going to see the motion is perpendicular to the bar. All right, so if the bar is vertical, you'll see the motion is horizontal. If the bar is diagonal, you'll see the motion is the opposite diagonal. Now the question is, how do we solve this, right? Because motion typically isn't ambiguous in the real world. So how do we solve this and where in the brain does it happen? Here's another example of this. Let's pick on you this time. Tell me what you see. All right, everybody see that? Two lines moving in opposite directions horizontally. What if I told you they were both moving up and down? I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. All right, so the way we'll do that is um, Now, how many of you see them moving up and down as opposed to... Raise your hand if you see it, the X moving up and down. Raise your hand if you still see the two ones going horizontal. This one you can sort of see both ways. It's uh, subject to attention. But the main difference here is all I did is added these two bars, which is suggesting that this bar is forming an occlusion. Right, so if your brain decides that this is occluding that, then it's not going to pay attention to what the ends of the lines are doing. Where if there is no occluder there, it's going to say, oh, the ends of the lines are telling me the real motion. Here's a curious one. Let's pick on you this time. What do you see? You see it going in one direction, or does it change direction? It changes direction. So right now it's moving horizontally, and now it moves yeah. vertically, right? Okay, let's see what it's really doing. If I move the cursor in there, it's one bar that's moving diagonally, but you're letting the edges of the slit 
control your perception of the motion. So this is all example of what's called the aperture problem. All right, I've shown you enough examples of this. Let's move on. So one way of solving the aperture problem is if you can't do it with a single bar, but let's say you had two bars. You could use the constraint from the two edges um, to solve the problem. Right? So the lower cell's telling you it's moving diagonally down. The upper cell's telling you it's diagonally up. But if you have the two together, that's telling you the diamond, the diamond is really moving in a horizontal direction. And so the question is, is there any place in the brain that's able to combine the outputs of different cells in order to give you the true direction of motion and solve the aperture problem? And that area of the brain is in a region of the brain called the medial temporal cortex. All right, it's part of the, it's the very end of the dorsal stream. And um, it does a lot of stuff that's related to motion. So um, it has one area called MT proper, uh, which is selective to the direction of motion. It's, um, and the way that you can show that is using a special kind of stimulus, uh, this thing here, which is called a grating. And so if we have, um, let's, I'm recording now from a cell in V1, and um, right, it likes a grating that's going down and to the right, doesn't like a horizontal grating, and doesn't like one that's going up and to the right. But now let's record that same behavior in um, MT. MT does the same, so it likes a cell that's going down and to the right, doesn't like one that's horizontal, doesn't like one that's up and to the right. Now notice I'm only showing these regions bars of a single orientation. So they can't use that inner section of constraints. In order to do that, you need more than one orientation. And there's a special kind of stimulus that lets you do that. And it's called a plaid stimulus, which looks like this. So here you see or one orientation. Here you have a different orientation. Now it looks up and to the right. But if you combine them, notice you see the horizontal motion. All right, so one orientation by itself, down and to the right. Other orientation by itself, up and to the right. Put the two together, and you correctly see the horizontal motion. So let's see how cells respond in V1 and medial temporal cortex. So if we do that, so now we're recording from MT. It responds to the plaid horizontal motion. Or it responds to the component horizontal motion. So it likes horizontal motion. but it won't respond to vertical motion, only to horizontal, not to diagonal either, or will respond to diagonal. So the basic idea here is that the V1 neurons respond to the individual components, but the MT neurons respond to the plaids, all right? So the MT neurons get the correct direction of motion by combining two orientations together. The V1 neurons can't do that. 
So if they've got the right orientation that they're sensitive to, that's what they'll respond to. Whereas the MT cells respond to the combination of the two orientations and their respective motions. Now there's another area of adjacent to MT called MSTI and MSTD. And they have, uh, what time does this class end? I'm sorry? Three forty, good. I got just enough time. Um, they respond to more complex patterns of motion. And any of you who've had, um, uh, well, doesn't matter. So there, there are three types of these patterns. So one is what's referred to as translation, right? So they have receptive fields that have complicated parts where um, they all the different subfields respond to motion in the same direction. So that's sensitive to translation. Um, there are also cells that respond to a pattern that looks like this. So this is what you would get if I take my hand, right, and move it close to you. You get this expansion pattern of motion. Or similarly, there are other cells that respond this way to what's called curl or rotary motion, all right? So in MST, uh, you've got all these different types of cells uh, represented. Now there's a great demo about this. I'll show you two. So here's one. You're going to see these expanding patterns. And then it stops. Stare at the red dot. Do you get an after effect? Get a bigger after effect? All right, so what happens is you see those expansions. Some cells are responding to the expansion of some sectors and the compression of others. And then you get an after effect of the opposite direction of motion. Now, the best example of this I know of is an illusion. I have to set this up. Uh, there's a big meeting in May every year of, uh, called the Meeting of the Vision Science Society. And everybody who does work in perception uh, shows up at this meeting. And um, one night during the meeting, they have an illusion contest. All right, so everybody who's discovered uh, a new illusion will bring it, and uh, then the audience votes on who had, who had the best illusion. And this is one by a guy whose name you'll hear several times in this course. He's uh, at MIT. His name is uh, Ted Adelson. And, uh, oh, I actually could have done the illusion his way. So Ted walks up to the stage on illusion night, and he's got this big umbrella. Right? And on the umbrella, there's this spiral pattern created. So he's standing up there talking to the audience um, while, so the umbrella is covering his face. And he's just spinning the umbrella while he's talking and nobody could see him. And everybody's going, what the hell is going on here? I mean, it's totally <laughs> weird. So you can imagine, let me get this started. I want you to stare at the center. Keep staring at the center. You are getting sleepy. <laughs> right? Now imagine Ted Adel, this is on an umbrella. Ted Adelson standing behind it, and he's talking to people about motion and the um, aperture problem. He's one of the leading researchers on that. So he's chatting away about the aperture problem while he's spinning this umbrella in front of everybody. And um, everybody's going, what the hell is this madman doing? And so keep staring at the center of that thing. It's actually crucially important that you do that. And then somewhere along the discussion, what Ted then does is he pulls the umbrella away 
and the subjects experience the following. <laughs> All right? Now you see the head expand? All right? That's the motion after effect, which is that divergent single that you're getting from that swirling pattern. Um, that doesn't look anything at all like Ted Adelson. And this demonstration is much more effective. One of these days I'm going to have to get an umbrella and try it. But there are some demos I don't have the nerve to try to pull off. But uh, this is one of them. Uh, I think that is my last slide, which it is. Remember, folks, we are not having class on Tuesday. 